So we're going through the chapter two note set from Canvas. So let's do a quick review before we delve into the bulk of chapter two. So first and foremost, let's just do a quick review of some of our classifications of matter. So we previously established that matter is composed of atoms, where an atom is the smallest unit of an element that has the properties and reactivity of that element. So for example, we, we used this example previously that a block of sodium metal will in turn react with water. So we have some water and we place the block of sodium metal in water, we will see that sodium reacts with water. Okay, now fundamentally this block of sodium is, is comprised of atoms of sodium and your sodium atom is more than capable of reacting with water. So this sodium atom has all of the properties and reactivity of bulk sodium. So essentially I like to think of elements as the, I like to think of atoms as the smallest functional unit of an element. Now atoms can be bonded together to generate molecules. So a molecule is the smallest unit of a substance containing two or more atoms bonded together. So a classic example of this is oxygen, which is O2. So we see two atoms of oxygen in an oxygen molecule. Uh, the key thing is the atoms do need to be covalent, do need to be bonded together via, via an ionic or covalent bond. Now, the empirical definition of elements is one that's quite interesting to think about. It's a substance that cannot be chemically decomposed to its component elements. So for example, if you start with hydrogen gas, the best you're gonna get out in terms of a simpler element is just hydrogen gas. You can't chemically decompose an element into simpler pure elements. Now, as we're gonna be dealing with a lot of element names and symbols in these next chapter sections, let's just review the fact that each element has a unique symbol. The symbols have one to two letters and the first and only the first letter is capitalized. So for example, CO is cobalt, while capital C, capital O is referring to a compound carbon monoxide. So you're gonna to wanna to become acquainted with each of the names and symbols for the elements that we tackle throughout these chapters. And this will be especially invaluable when we start talking about chemical nomenclature, which is naming pure elements and naming compounds. Okay, so let's delve now into our introduction to chapter two, which is the idea of radioactive elements and how these radioactive elements have provided us an insight into atomic structure. So atoms of each element have different masses, reactivity, physical properties, and chemical properties. So that begs the question, what is different about each of these different elements? what is different structurally about different elements. So there are early experiments that were focused on understanding the composition and structure of an atom, trying to figure out what are atoms made of. And an important discussion to give us insight into atomic structure has to do with Baccarel's early observations of radioactivity. So what is radioactivity? What is a radioactive element? Well, radioactive elements are unstable and they eject particles that make up the atom to generate a more stable atom. So this photo here um, is quite a striking historical photo as it really provided 
an interesting piece of evidence supporting the idea that elements can be radioactive and that these emissions um, can be observed and studied further. So in this experiment or in this famous photo, Baccarel was looking, this, this picture is of a photographic plate. And in this experiment or in this accidental observation, he stored a radioactive element in a closed container and it was placed and it was placed in close proximity to a photographic plate. Now, what was quite interesting is that as the plate was not exposed to light, as the container was closed, you would not expect the plate to be stained by any external sources. However, because the plate was stored next to a radioactive sample, it would emit particles, which would then stain the photographic plate. And this observation could be reproduced and even observed if he separated the plate from the radioactive sample, even with surfaces of varying width. So the main thing that I want you to take away from this picture, and the main reason why this picture is so interesting, as it shows a few things. First, this radioactive element is unstable and it's clearly emitting particles or energy and that energy is capable of staining our photographic plate. We also have a method for observing radioactive emissions in a somewhat crude manner. So radioactive elements, so just to recap, radioactive elements are unstable. So if we think about a radioactive element, such as, for example, uranium, this radioactive element can be thought of as a composition of component particles. And as a radioactive element decomposes, we will end up emitting some of these component particles that make up an atom. Now, because when a radioactive element decomposes, it emits the particles that make up an atom, by studying radioactive emissions, we can study the particles that comprise an atom. So this really gives us a tool to begin to study the fundamental components of an atom. These are component subatomic particles. Okay, so we can take this one step further. And, but before we do that, in order to contextualize the results of some of these early experiments, delving into and trying to understand atomic structure, we have to look at some charge particle interactions. So as a general rule of thumb, like charges repel, opposite charges attract, okay? So if you have a negative and a positively charged particle, those two particles will attract. If you have two particles with the same charge, these particles will repel. Now further, charged particles are deflected by electromagnetic fields. So for example, if you have a charged particle, such as a positively charged particle passing through 
a electromagnetic field such as that generated by two plates. We will see in these experiments that these particles deflect in an electromagnetic field. And this deflection depends on the charge of your particle. Charged particles with a different charge will deflect in a different direction based on their charge. So what do I mean by that? So suppose we have a positive particle and we have our plate. Let me flip that one moment. So if we have a positively charged particle and we have a set of plates to generate an electromagnetic field, our positively charged particle will, for example, deflect towards one of the two plates. If we repeat this experiment, except this time we look at the deflection pattern of a negatively charged particle, what we will see is that the negatively charged particle will deflect in the opposite direction. So we can look at how these particles behave and deflect in an electromagnetic field to give us insight into the charge of that particle. Okay. So, so we slowly have a set of ideas to help contextualize this next experimental result, which I think is a quite an informative experiment. So one of Rutherford's quite interesting experiments has to do with looking at the emissions from a radioactive element. So in this experiment, a radioactive element is placed in a, in a sample container and it is allowed to emit its particles throughout a well-defined slit. A magnetic field is applied in a vacuum and three photographic plates are placed. These plates are designed to detect particles when they impact the plate. Now, we've already established that radioactive elements will decompose and emit their component particles. These particles are, in many cases, charged ions, and they can have either a positive or negative charge. Now, as we can clearly see in this, in this rough schematic, we observe one, two, three, unique deflection patterns. This suggests as the deflection of a particle in a magnetic field depends on the charge, that we have three particles, each with a different and unique charge. So let's look at each of our cases individually. So one particle experiences no deflection and as it experiences no deflection, if the deflection is based on the charge, we can propose that atoms likely have a particle that has no charge or a neutral particle. So this is what we see in deflection pattern two. The other two particles deflect in the exact opposite directions. So since particles deflect in a magnetic field based on their charge, we can conclude that we have two particles, each with an equal but opposite charge. So we can conclude that atoms are composed of a positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle. So if we had to, to annotate, two would represent our neutral particle three could represent our positively charged particle, one could represent the deflection pattern for our negatively charged particle. So this experiment is pretty powerful in that it's demonstrated a few things. First and foremost, 
we've looked at radioactive elements and used them to study the subatomic particles that make up atoms. We, from this experiment, have concluded overall that there are three different types of particles found in atoms, and each of those three particles have a different unique charge. There's a negatively charged particle, a neutral particle, and a positively charged subatomic particle. Just as a, as a sort of a spoiler and a precursor to this next discussion, we can conclude that atoms are composed of three different types of fundamental particles. And we'll see in these next few studies that the protons are the positively charged particles. The neutrons are our neutral particles, particles without a charge. And the electrons are negatively charged particles. Any questions so far on this discussion? If not, let's continue on. So let's look next at electrons in detail. So we're gonna focus on the fundamental experiments used to elucidate the charge, mass, and other properties of an electron. And it started with early interest and study of a setup known as a Crookes tube. Now, we don't have these in modern TVs, but these setups were extremely prevalent in old school televisions. And essentially what a Crookes tube is, is an evacuated glass tube. It has an electrical charge applied at both ends, and this generates a quote unquote cathode ray beam. And these are visible with the naked eye, and we can manipulate and perform experiments studying the cathode ray beam. Now, what is a cathode ray beam? It's a beam of particles passing between two metal plates in a vacuum tube. So the question then becomes, what are the particles? So what is passing between these two plates? What types of particles? What are their properties? What can we figure out about these particles? Well, after a few experiments, the following conclusions could be reached. First, cathode rays were observed to travel in a straight line, okay? They were found, it was found that cathode rays are deflected by electric and magnetic fields and that they are deflected by an electrical field towards the positive plate. Opposite charges attract. This highly suggests that the cathode ray beams are negative in charge. So we have some sort of beam of negatively charged particles. It's beginning to sound eerily familiar to something that we've seen before. So if you have a negatively charged particle, it's attracted and it will deflect towards the positively charged plate. So that suggests that we have negatively charged particles. Okay, the next experiment, it seems really minor, but it actually has a lot of insight. These cathode rays are capable of moving a small paddle wheel. Thus, cathode rays are composed of particles with mass. So we're beginning to have a bit of a model where we know that these cathode ray beams are composed of particles with mass and charge, and the charge is negative. So after additional experiments and study, they were able to conclude that cathode rays can be thought of as beams of negatively charged particles that we call electrons. Now from this, we can study these cathode rays and 
in essence, the smallest amount of charge per unit mass of the cathode ray is the charge to mass ratio of an electron. So by studying this bulk collection of particles, we can look at the properties of a single particle. Okay, so let's talk about how did we measure the charge to mass ratio. Well, we've previously discussed that the charge to mass ratio of your cathode ray is the charge to mass ratio of an electron. So then, by looking at how your cathode ray deflects in an electromagnetic field, we can figure out and we can get a sense of the mass to charge ratio. So the deflection of this cathode ray beam that we observe is based on the mass and charge of the electron. So by measuring the deflection of the beam in an electromagnetic field, we can calculate the charge to mass ratio of an electron. And the principle that drives this idea is that the charge to mass ratio, this charge to mass ratio, is an intensive property. No matter how many particles we have, the charge, if the charge to mass ratio will always remain the same for the same type of subatomic particle. Now it was found that the charge to mass ratio was 1.76 times 10 to the eighth coulombs per gram, where this C represents coulombs, which is just a unit of charge. Okay, so by studying these cathode ray beams, we were able to elucidate a pretty fundamental property of subatomic particles of the electron, which is the charge to mass ratio. Now we can go one step further and with additional experiments, we can even calculate to a startling degree of accuracy, the overall mass of an electron. Any questions so far? Okay, let's keep going then. One moment. Allow me one moment just to reset one note so that way there's not as much of a delay. Okay, so now we're going to look at one of the key experiments in elucidating the charge of an electron, which is the Millikan oil drop experiment. It's quite a clever experiment in design. So the way it's set up, you have an atomizer and at the top of this chamber, you're generating oil droplets. Okay, you have a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate. And what you're going to do is you're going to allow the oil drops to pass down a small collimating slit and you're going to expose it to ionizing radiation. After exposure to ionizing radiation, our oil drops will gain electrons and become charged. So we have this oil drop that after being exposed to ionizing radiation will have gained a negative charge 
Now, because this oil drop is now charged, so let's show that. Because this oil drop is now charged, we can manipulate and adjust our electric field to manipulate the position of the oil drop and how readily that oil drop will move up or down towards the plates. Now, just to summarize and just to showcase in detail what is happening to our oil drop. So our oil drop initially has no charge. When it's exposed to ionizing radiation, it gains electrons and it becomes negatively charged. Okay. Now, a critical idea in this experiment, a critical concession of this experiment, is that the oil drop can gain any number of electrons. And it, as a result, it will have a negative charge equal to the total charge of all electrons gained. Now, once we have our oil drop, there we can do some classical force analysis, just like in physics. And if we look at all the forces acting on the oil drop, we have the applied electromagnetic field, which is based on the charge, and the force of gravity, which is based on the mass. And if we carefully adjust the electromagnetic field, eventually, the particle will remain suspended in the field. It'll just remain floating in the collection chamber. It won't be moving up or down. It'll just stay perfectly still. And we can observe that with a viewing microscope. Now, when our oil drop is perfectly still in our collection chamber, we have a relationship between the force of gravity, which is related to mass, and the force applied by the electric field, which is based on the charge. So, again, just to recap, the oil drops become charged by gaining electrons. Oil drops will have different total charges as they gain a different number of electrons. The charge of the oil drops Fundamentally, however, will be multiples of the smallest unit of charge, the charge of an electron. So if we measure the, the charge of a huge number of oil drops, we can begin to notice a common unit of charge, which is the charge of an electron. So how do we do that? Well, we know that the charge of the oil drop depends on the number of electrons and the charge of an electron. So in this case, if we have four electrons gained, the charge of this oil drop would be four times the charge of an electron. If we have six electrons, the charge of our oil drop will be six times the charge of an electron. Now, we can't control the number of electrons an oil drop gains. Each oil drop will have a different number of electrons. Can't really fix that. But by measuring the charge of thousands of oil drops, the charge of an electron can be determined by calculating the smallest common unit of charge, the smallest common factor between all of our measured charges. This in turn allowed the charge of an electron to be determined and it was found to be negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So it's a relatively small charge for a single electron. Now this is where things get really exciting. From these two experiments, from our study of cathode ray beams and from the Millikan oil drop experiment, we have determined the charge of an electron and the charge to mass ratio of an electron. So then we can solve for the mass of an electron by taking the charge, which is negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, 
and in turn divide by the charge to mass ratio, which is negative 1.76 times 10 to the eighth coulombs per gram. Coulombs cancel and we're left with the mass of an electron. And let's punch this into our calculator as from simple, relatively simple experiments that are even run by in undergraduate teaching laboratories, we have been able to elucidate the fundamental mass of one of the fundamental particles that make up matter. So this is quite an exciting result when you consider its implications. That gives us 0 0.9091 times 10 to the negative 27th grams, which is 9.091 to the negative 28th gram. So this is quite an exciting result. So from these experiments, we've been able to figure out the mass of an electron, something that is very difficult to measure directly. This is a very, very, very small mass and electrons are very, very, very small particles. So we've figured out a lot of properties and a lot of characteristics of our electrons. Let's now turn and let's look at protons. Another fundamental particle that comprises an atom. So protons and the atomic number. So radioactive elements can emit beta decay, which functionally is electrons, and alpha decay, which is a helium nucleus. Now, that fact alone is not important. But one thing I do want you to focus on is this idea that when a radioactive element undergoes alpha decay, it loses protons and it becomes a different element. So these, these are nuclear reactions, which have slightly different rules than chemical reactions. Now, because when we change the number of protons, our element identity changes, this suggests, and this is really important, that an element's identity is based on the number of protons in a given atom. So each element, each unique element, has a unique number of protons, which is written as the atomic number Z. So if you look in the periodic table, each unique element has a unique atomic number. So just to summarize this idea, when you look at the periodic table, each unique element has a unique element symbol and a unique atomic number. So protons play an integral role in an element's identity. If you change the number of protons, you change your element's identity. Does this idea make sense to everyone? Any questions on this idea? Any questions on what the atomic number represents? It's representing the number of protons. Any questions so far? If not, let's continue on. This is really providing us the chemical history background necessary to begin to understand atomic structure and the properties of subatomic particles. So let's look at atomic structure and one of the seminal experiments was Rutherford's gold foil experiment, which presented quite a striking result. So. We have all these fundamental particles, and the question that we need to ask ourselves is how are subatomic particles arranged? How are subatomic particles arranged in atoms? 
One of the old models of atomic structure was Thomson's plum pudding model. And you can think of it sort of like yogurt or a muffin with, with berries or fruit or chocolate in it, whatever suits your fancy. And in Thomson's plum pudding model, we have our electrons and our electrons are distributed throughout our atom. Okay. And our electrons are surrounded by a sphere of positive charge. So the key features of the plum pudding model, electrons are distributed throughout the atom and two, the electrons are surrounded by a cloud of positive charge. Okay. Now, we, we already can notice a bit of dissonance with our with our previous studies of subatomic particles. Um, we, we clearly have evidence that there are positively charged particles that we have called protons. So to discuss and to showcase the flaws in this model, Thompson proposed, oh sorry, Rutherford proposed quite an interesting experiment known as the gold foil experiment. So in this experiment, we have a radioactive sample that is emitting alpha particles. So you can think of an alpha particle as a clump of protons and neutrons. Let me draw that a little bit better. This is known as an alpha particle. So this beam of alpha particles is shot at a sheet of gold foil. And we have a detector surrounding that sheet of gold foil, which allows us to observe where do these alpha particles end up after they impact the gold foil. Well, let's dissect a little bit. What does a piece of gold foil actually look like if you stare at it from a micro scale perspective? So let's suppose we have a piece of gold foil. How does it look like, how does the piece of gold foil look when we stare at it under a microscope? Well, we can think of a piece of gold foil as a collection of gold atoms, okay? Right, fundamentally matter is composed of atoms. Okay, so these are our gold atoms. And what we see in this experiment, what we see in this experiment is that when we fire off our alpha particles, when we fire our beam of alpha particles, for the most part, this beam just passes straight through our atoms. So because this gold foil isn't really much of a barrier to an alpha particle, these gold atoms are mostly empty space. We can write down our first common thread between the Rutherford and the plum pudding model is that atoms are mainly empty space. Does everyone notice how in this picture the alpha particles are passing straight through our gold foil. Does everyone see that from our picture? Can I get a few responses in the chat just 
looking at this picture, is there anything else that we see with regards to our alpha particle deflection? So we have some cases that the alpha particles just pass straight through the gold foil. Do we see anything else in this picture? Are, the, is there, are there any other deflections that we need to discuss? Is there anything else that we need to discuss? Is there anything that, that seems odd in this picture? Some of them are passing through them. Yep. Sorry, in between them. Yep, sure. So we, we observe atoms are mostly empty, splay, empty space. So our alpha particle is just passing straight through our atoms. And yes, we do notice in, in one case, and let's highlight that and let's put a circle around it as someone very astutely pointed out, we do see a pretty dramatic deflection. So our question then becomes, what is causing that deflection? Well, to answer that question, so our question now becomes, what causes the alpha particles to deflect. So in a small number of cases, in a very small number of cases, the alpha particles will deflect at a very dramatic angle. Now this can be rationalized by thinking for a moment, if we have our alpha particle, which is a positively charged particle, In order for an alpha particle to deflect, our alpha particle must interact with another positively charged particle. So our alpha particle deflects when it impacts a positively charged particle. So as this deflection occurs a relatively small number of times, we can conclude that there is a mass of positive charge somewhere in our atoms that takes up a relatively small amount of space. So when our alpha particle is shot at our piece of gold foil, in a small number of cases, in a small number of cases, our alpha particle interacts with this lump of positive charge and we observe a very dramatic deflection. So we conclude that there's a very strong charge-charge interaction is, is taking place when our alpha particle impacts this lump of positive charge. In most cases, however, atoms are mostly empty space. So this alpha particle will just pass right on through. And it's these deflections, these minor deflections that really set the stage and showcase the major flaw in the plum pudding model. So to answer the question, what causes our alpha particles to deflect? There is a clump of positively charged particles So to answer your question, quite simply, a deflection occurs when this alpha particle interacts with and impacts a, our clump of positive charge. So charge-charge interactions are repulsive. So when we see these alpha particles rapidly deflecting when they hit the gold foil in a small number of cases, these small number of cases occur when our alpha particle is directly impacting and interacting with our positively charged center of most atoms. So essentially the deflection occurs when our alpha particle interacts with something with a positive charge. 
And because this interaction occurs in a very small number of, of cases, we can conclude that this lump of positive charge takes up a relatively small amount of space. Yes, alpha particles are positively charged. Yep. They're positively charged particles. And the reason why they're used in this experiment is because they're very useful for detecting charge charge interactions. And alpha particles are easy to generate and monitor. So we can conclude in this experiment that because our alpha particles deflect, that deflection is caused by interactions with a positively charged particle. And this deflection occurs a small number of times. So then we can conclude that this lump of positive charge takes up a relatively small amount of space. So to answer the question, what causes the alpha particles to deflect, we have a clump of positively charged particles at the center of the atom. That makes up A small amount Of space in an atom. Yes, so to summarize this idea, opposite charges repel. If our alpha particle is rapidly deflecting when it's shot into the gold foil in a small number of cases, that implies in a small number of cases, this alpha particle is bumping into a positively charged lump of particles. This occurs a relatively small number of, of times because atoms overall are mostly empty space. Yes, exactly. It's an interaction between our alpha particle and this lump of positive charge that we call the nucleus. Yep, that's exactly right. So this experiment really provided relatively strong evidence in support of this idea that there is a clump of positively charged particles at the center of the atom that occupies a small volume of the atom. And we call this lump of positively charged particles the nucleus. So let's summarize the results of Rutherford's experiment into Rutherford nuclear theory. So in Rutherford nuclear theory, most of the atom's mass and all of its positive charge are contained in a cluster of protons and neutrons that we call the nucleus. So the nucleus contains all of our positively charged protons and our neutral neutrons. Now, additionally, as we saw a relatively small number of deflection events, most of an atom's volume is empty space. So if, if this little dot was our nucleus, an atom's overall volume, if we, if we want to, if we put this dot as the nucleus, we'd have to draw the outer bounds of our atom to be miles and miles away. The nucleus occupies a very, very, very small volume in our atom. Most of an atom's volume is empty space. So we have our nucleus and then we have the rest of our atom. So most of our atom is empty space. Now you may ask what surrounds the nucleus? Where are our electrons in all of this? Well, atoms are neutral 
and there are an equal number of negatively charged electrons surrounding the nucleus and positively charged protons in the nucleus. So for example, if we're looking at helium, let's use the correct color for that. So if we're looking at helium and a helium nucleus, We have two protons in our nucleus. And following this rule, if atoms are neutral, how many electrons are surrounding our nucleus? Following this rule that atoms are neutral and we have an equal number of protons and electrons, how many electrons would we have? How many negatively charged particles should I draw? Two, yeah. And the key feature to keep in mind is that the electrons surround the nucleus. And later chapters of this course really focus in on where are the electrons and how do the electrons behave. Does this make sense? Do the, is, are these experiments starting to fit together to help understand a little bit of how atoms are put together, what the structure of an atom is, and what particles make up an atom? Okay, so this early portion of this chapter was primarily historical to give you the basis to understand atomic structure and function from the context of experiments. What we're now going to do is we're going to take what we've learned about atomic structure and the particles that comprise an atom and we're going to look at a few ways that we can describe atoms with different numbers of each of these fundamental particles. So just as a historical footnote to close out our discussion of history, let's talk briefly about protons and neutrons. So protons, it was found that if you take nitrogen 14 and you bombarded it with alpha particles, you notice the emission of a particle with a mass to charge matching a hydrogen nucleus. So looks something like this. This is a hydrogen nucleus. Now a proton, it, this particle that represents a hydrogen nucleus is called a proton. And this mass to charge ratio can be figured out in a similar way to that of an electron or more directly via mass spectrometry, which we'll talk more about later in this chapter. For the neutron, the neutron was actually not discovered until a substantial amount of time later. Um, it has to do with some logistical issues with detecting a neutral particle. The existence of a neutron was postulated for a long time because if you look at the mass of an atom, the mass of an atom does not match our expected mass if we assume atoms only contain protons and electrons. There is some particle in our atoms that are neutral with mass. So Chadwick developed this really ingenious experiment where if he bombarded beryllium with alpha particles, a free neutron was generated. So we call this particle a neutron and a neutron is a neutral particle. So it has no charge. But it does have mass. Okay, so from Chadwick's experiments, we have evidence and we have an exact measurement for this idea that atoms contain neutral particles with mass called neutrons. Okay, so these are all the seminal experiments to elucidate the components of an atom. Now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on how, 
what are the properties of subatomic particles and how do we represent and write out and describe atoms with different numbers of these sub fundamental subatomic particles. Okay, so just as a summary, our three fundamental particles are proton, neutron, and electron. Wonderful. The proton is positively charged, the electron is negatively charged, the neutron has zero charge. It's neutral. The proton and neutron have, the, have an identical mass. The electron has a very small mass. So when you think of an electron, think very, very, very small particles. Electrons have a very small mass. So this summary sheet, I'm not expecting you to memorize the exact mass and charge values. I am expecting you to know the relative mass and charge. You need to know neutrons are neutral, protons are positive, electrons are negative, and the mass of an electron is way less than a proton or neutron. Does that make sense, what's expected of you? Okay, so one way that we describe the mass of atoms and subatomic particles is the unit AMU, also abbreviated U. One AMU represents 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So the mass of a proton is about one AMU. The mass of our neutron is about one AMU, and the mass of our electron is about one times 10 to the negative fourth AMU. Now you may ask, where did we come up with this standard unit of measurement? Where did we come up with this idea of an AMU? What is an AMU reference to? Well, an AMU is 1 12th the mass of a carbon 12 nucleus. And a carbon-12 nucleus is just easy to study via, it's easy to study and it's very easy to generate in a reproducible manner. So it serves as the standard for the atomic mass unit. Okay, so let's now take this idea that we have all of these fundamental subatomic particles and let's talk about describing atoms with different numbers of these subatomic particles. And to do that, we're going to utilize atomic notation and isotope notation. So first and foremost, when you look at isotope notation, there are a few major features to keep in mind. Each of these numbers are placed in a specific location and represents a unique quantity. So this number in the upper left hand corner represents what we call the mass number. The number given as the leftmost subscript represents our atomic number. And the atomic number is optional. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. If your particle is charged, your charge will be found in the upper right-hand corner. And most importantly, for the majority of elements that you'll see, unless you're playing a fill-in-the-blank game or dealing with a problem where it's intentionally left blank, you will always be provided the element symbol for your element. Now, just as a refresher, the atomic number, the atomic number represents the number of protons. The atomic number is unique for each element and most importantly, it's directly correlated and it's linked for each unique atomic symbol. 
So if you go in the periodic table for any atomic symbol and you look right above the atomic symbol, you'll see clearly in the periodic table the atomic number. So given a periodic table, you have all the tools you need to fill in the atomic number given the atomic symbol. So for example, if I gave you just the symbol chlorine 35, we would be able to go to the periodic table and fill in that chlorine has an atomic number of 17. Does this process make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense? Yes. So my, my question then is, looking at iron, would someone like to try and open up a copy of the periodic table from either your previous note set or one of your personal periodic tables? And would someone be able to tell me what is the atomic number of iron? What is the atomic number of iron? 26. Oh, yeah. 20, yep, 26. Exactly right. So if you go into the periodic table for iron, you'll see the atomic number right above the symbol. Perfect. So we're already getting acquainted with reviewing the periodic table and utilizing the periodic table as a reference to determine and locate quantities that we need. Wonderful. Okay. So there are a few things to keep in mind in terms of calculations. The mass number is defined as the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So the mass number is sort of a, 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 the approximate total mass of your atom. So it's the protons plus the number of neutrons. The charge is equal to the number of protons, which we can sometimes write as P plus, minus the number of electrons, which is represented as E minus. If we wanted to represent neutrons using these abbreviated symbols, so protons are P plus, Neutrons are N zero. So this shows how the mass number and charge are calculated in isotope notation. We have special phrasing for different types of charged particles. We call a negatively charged atom an anion. Anions have more electrons than protons. We call a positively charged particle or positively charged atom a cation. In this case, it has more protons than electrons. Any questions so far? If not, let's continue on. So one revised definition of an element that we can use is a substance whose atoms all contain an identical number of protons or whose atoms have an identical atomic number. Each element has a unique symbol with a unique atomic number. And of course, we have all the tools we need to figure out the atomic number from the atomic symbol and the periodic table. So for example, in our chlorine example, we filled in our atomic number of 17. For iron, we filled in our atomic number of 26. Again, just to show what you would see if you look in the periodic table, the atomic number Z is the number above your element symbol. Wonderful. So we have all the tools we need so far to begin to break apart this isotope notation and figure out the number of each of these fundamental particles. So 
again, just reading the periodic table, the number above your element symbol is your atomic number. Another thing to note is that the atomic symbol and the name are also linked. So given the name, you can also figure out the atomic number. One other number that we're going to mention in this reference, but we will we'll delve into it in a later portion of this chapter. This number below your element symbol is your average atomic mass. And we'll utilize this a little bit later on to begin to understand the amount of each element's isotope in nature. Okay, so let's keep going from here. So isotopes are atoms of the same element with a different mass number and a different number of neutrons. So isotopes, as they're the same element, will have the same chemical properties, but different masses. So an example of two isotopes would be oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. As we can see very clearly, we have two different mass numbers. While in contrast, we have an identical atomic number. If you like, you can also write isotopes in shorthand notation. So we write our symbol followed by our mass number. Now, from the atomic number and the mass number, we can in turn figure out the number of neutrons. We can in turn figure out the number of neutrons. Oops, let me change that one moment. There we go. So then, if we rearrange our equation for the mass number to solve for the number of neutrons, we get the number of neutrons is equal to the mass number minus the number of protons. Perfect. So let's look at an example for oxygen 18. So filling in the blanks here, we know that our mass number is 18. We know that our number of protons, in other words, the atomic number for oxygen what, what is the atomic number for oxygen? What is the atomic number for oxygen? Eight. So then that gives us for our total number of neutrons in oxygen 18, we have 10 neutrons. We can repeat this calculation for oxygen 16. In which case, let's figure out our number of neutrons. So our number of neutrons in this case is equal to our mass number. Which is 16 minus our atomic number, which is eight. Which in turn gives us a number of neutrons of eight neutrons. So as we can clearly see, 
these two isotopes have a different mass number and they have a different number of neutrons. Does this make sense so far to everyone? Is everyone comfortable calculating the number of neutrons and protons in a given atom? So to test our understanding, let's now tackle, given a periodic table, let's now tackle the following problem after a guided example. So let's do one more guided example together. So we have bromine 79. The first thing I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do using my periodic table is I'm going to find my atomic number and I'm going to fill that in immediately. So then we know that our number of protons is equal to the atomic number, which is equal to 35. Now we have all the information we need to calculate the number of neutrons, which is equal to the mass number which is 79 minus our atomic number. And our atomic number in this case is 35. That in turn gives us a calculated number of neutrons of 44 neutrons. Okay, let's dissect another example. Magnesium 24. What does this 24 represent? What does that 24 represent? What is that 24? Is that our atomic number, mass number? What is it? It's the mass number. So let's put it in the upper left-hand corner. Let's now go to our periodic table. For magnesium, what is our atomic number for magnesium looking at the periodic table? What is our atomic number? Twelve. Twelve, yep, exactly right. Perfect. So we know immediately that our number of protons is equal to 12, because the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. Now let's figure out our number of neutrons. So our number of neutrons is equal to our mass number. One moment. Which is 24 minus our number of protons, which in this case is 12. So that in turn for our total number of neutrons gives us 12 neutrons. Does this process make sense to everyone so far? Perfect. So to test our understanding, I'd like you to open up Canvas Quiz 2.11. And I'd like you to attempt and calculate the number of protons and neutrons in the following atoms. And just as a correction really quickly, this should be carbon 13, as that's what will appear in your Canvas quiz. And I'll be checking to see how everyone's doing. And you're more than welcome to submit your responses via Canvas or uh, through the Zoom chat feature. So let's take about three minutes to work through this example and we'll come, we'll come together to discuss in about three minutes.
If you're going through the quizzes tab, they'll all appear together. But if you go into the assignments tab, the chapter two quizzes should be sorted based on the chapter two quizzes should be sorted based on the chapter. So I'm seeing a lot of reasonable responses in the chat. Let's try to get a few more responses via, via canvasser in the chat, and then we'll discuss in about another minute. So I'm seeing a lot of responses via Canvas. So let's now discuss this set of problems. So for neon, the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to figure out its atomic number. So if we go to neon, we see the atomic number for neon is what? What is the atomic number for neon? What atomic number did we find for neon? 10, yep. So let's fill that in. So we know our number of protons is equal to 10. For our number of neutrons, our number of neutrons is equal to the mass number, which in this case is 20, minus the number of protons, which in this case is 10. 20 minus 10 gives us 10 neutrons. Okay, so let's now look at carbon 13. I always like to write it in standard isotope notation. So what does this 13 represent? What does this 13 represent? Is, the, is it the atomic number, the mass number? What is that 13? It's a mass number, yep. So then looking at carbon in the periodic table, what is carbon's atomic number? What is carbon's atomic number? Six, yep. The 12 is the average atomic mass, but six is the atomic number. So we see our number of protons is equal to six. And now let's calculate the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons are equal to the mass number minus the number of protons and that gives us seven neutrons. Does this make, so, make sense to everyone so far? Yes. Any, okay, perfect. So let's talk about this next example, which is looking at ions. So ions are the same element with a different charge. In other words, a different number of electrons. So for example, O18 as written here is neutral, but O18 to minus is an anion. So the only thing different between two ions 
is that we have a different charge. Different charge, which implies a different number of electrons. Now, if we know the atomic number, so if we know the atomic number and the charge, we can calculate the number of electrons. So, in terms of naming different charged particles, an anion is known as a negatively charged ion, while a cation is a positively charged ion. So if we rearrange our equation for charge, we can solve for the number of electrons and that in turn gives us the equation, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons minus the charge. So let's apply this to a few examples. Let's apply this to a few examples, but we will need to play a bit of a fill in the blank game here. So let's start with sulfur. What is sulfur's atomic number? So if I look at the periodic table for sulfur, what atomic number do we see? 16, yep. So then we now have all the information that we need to calculate the number of electrons. So our, our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons, in this case is 16, minus the charge. And in this case, you need to be really careful about the sign. The charge is negative two, so when you subtract a negative number, you end up with a positive number. So this gives us 18 electrons. Okay, let's do the same thing for potassium. Let's do the same thing for potassium. What do we fill in for our number of protons or our atomic number? What is the atomic number for potassium? 19, exactly right, 19, okay. So we know that our number of protons is equal to 19 and we can solve for the number of electrons. So our number of electrons is equal to the number of protons, which is 19 minus the charge. And what is the charge in this case? What is the charge of potassium in this case? What is the charge? What is the charge? Plus one, right? Okay, that in turn gives us 18 electrons overall. Now, there's a special term that's sometimes brought up when you talk about ions, and it's called quote unquote isoelectronic. What this word means is two ions or atoms with the same number of electrons. Do you notice how in this example, S2 minus and potassium plus both have 18 electrons? Does everyone notice that? Yep, so we'd call S2 minus, sulfur two minus, and potassium plus isoelectronic ions. So it's just a word that you may see in the online homework, or it may pop up on the ACS. Any other questions on this example? If not, let's continue on now. So in this example, we'll calculate the number of protons and electrons in the following ions. 
So we'll start off. So for nitrogen three minus, I need to figure out nitrogen's atomic number. So if I go to the periodic table, my atomic number for nitrogen is seven. Okay, while we're here, while I'm looking at the periodic table in my reference sheet, let's also fill in the atomic number for aluminum, which is 13. Now what we're going to do is write down our number of protons. So the number of protons would be seven for nitrogen and the number of protons would be 13 for aluminum. Now to calculate the number of electrons, we take the number of protons, which is seven, minus the charge, which is negative three for N3 minus, and that gives us 10 electrons. For aluminum, our number of electrons is equal to 13 our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons, which is 13 minus the charge, which is positive three, giving us 10 electrons. Does this example make sense? Any questions on this example? Okay, if there aren't any questions, let's open up Canvas Quiz 2.11.1 and, and I'll have you calculate the number of protons and electrons in the following two ions. So I'll give everyone about three minutes to work through this example and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. I'm already seeing a few reasonable responses in the chat. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and on Canvas, and we'll discuss in about, in about a minute and a half. Seeing a lot of reasonable responses in the chat and via Canvas. So let's discuss this example now. So if we look at chlorine in the periodic table, we'll be able to find the atomic number as most many of the students have pointed out, it's 17. So our number of protons in chlorine is 17. To calculate the number of electrons, we take the number of protons minus the charge, which gives us a number of electrons of 18. For calcium, our atomic number is 20. So our number of protons is equal to 20. To calculate the number of electrons, We take the number of protons, which is 20, minus the charge, which is two, giving us 18 electrons. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? If not, let's continue on and work through a few additional problems. So in this case, we're asked to list the total number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in each of the following ions. So starting off with this bromine ion, we know that our number of protons is equal to our atomic number, which is 35. We know that our number of neutrons is equal to our mass number, which is 81 
minus our atomic number of 35, and that in turn gives us 46 neutrons. Our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons, which is 35, minus the charge, which is negative 1, to give us 36 electrons. Does this first example make sense? Any questions on this first example? So let's continue on with the next example. Iron, we can look in the periodic table and fill in its atomic number. Iron has an atomic number of 26. So then for our number of protons, we'd have 26 protons. For our number of neutrons, we take the mass number minus the number of protons, which gives us 30 neutrons. And for our number of electrons, we take our number of protons minus the charge, which gives us 23 electrons to work with. Perfect. So, any questions on these examples? If not, let's have everyone work. Let's, let's do one more where we're asked to write the isotope symbol for an element with 26 protons, 30 neutrons, and 24 electrons. So this time we have to build up the isotope symbol from scratch. Okay. So our number of protons is equal to 26. Our number of neutrons is equal to 30. We know that the mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we have 26 plus 30, giving us 56. Our number of electrons is 24. So our charge is equal to our number of protons minus our number of electrons. So 26 minus 24 gives us a charge of positive two. And we know that our, num that our atomic number is equal to our number of protons, which is 26. So the real question now becomes, so if I fill in my mass number, I fill in my atomic number, and I fill in my charge, what do I fill in for the symbol? What element has 26 protons? What element, when you look in the periodic table, has an atomic number of 26? And as one of your classmates astutely pointed out, it has an atomic number, iron has an atomic number of 26. So this is iron, 56, 2 plus. Does this example make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable building isotope symbols given the number of subatomic particles? Okay, so let's take a look at the following example now. So let's start off with the first two portions of this Canvas Quiz 2.11-2. There are three parts, but let's start with these first two parts and I'll give everyone about, about three minutes, three to four minutes. And don't be shy to submit your responses via Canvas or uh, via the chat function. 
And if you have any questions, don't be shy to propose them in the chat or to unmute and ask your questions verbally. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat or via the Canvas quiz, and then we'll discuss. Does this a 31 represent? Is that the mass or the atomic number? Ah, the number in the upper left-hand corner yeah. represents the mass number. Okay. Yep. The bottom left-hand corner represents the atomic number. So we see some reasonable responses in the chat. Let's get a few more responses and then we'll discuss. And we'll discuss in about another minute and a half to two minutes. And let's try to get some responses for the second isotope symbol. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to message me via the chat feature or unmute and ask your question. We'll give everyone some more time and we'll discuss in about a minute and a half, just so that way we get a reasonable pool of responses. I see a, a few responses via Canvas. Let's try to get a few more before we discuss and we'll discuss in about another minute. So I see a, a reasonable pool of responses in, in the chat and the, can, in the Canvas responses. So let's discuss these examples. So phosphorus, so we have phosphorus 31, three minus. So we need to fill in now the atomic number. Would someone like to provide the atomic number for phosphorus? What is the atomic number for phosphorus? 15, yep, perfect. Okay, so then our number of protons is equal to the atomic number, which is 15. Now our number of neutrons is equal to the mass number, which is 31, minus the number of protons, which is 15, which gives us 16 neutrons. Finally, our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons, which is 15, minus the charge, which is three minus, which gives us a number of electrons of 18. Any questions on this first example? Any questions on this first example? If not, let's go over the second example. So barium to plus 138. And my question to all of you is, what is the atomic number of barium? So if we go to the periodic table and find barium, what is the atomic number for barium? 
56, exactly right, exactly right. So then let's enter that in. So we know that our number of protons is equal to 56. Our number of neutrons is equal to our mass number, which is 138 minus our atomic number, which is 56, which gives us 82 neutrons. And our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons minus the charge, which gives us 54 electrons. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Any questions so far? So let's take this moment now and let's spend about a minute and a half to two minutes and let's try to propose and write an isotope symbol for an element with 92 protons, 143 neutrons, and 91 electrons. Let's try to select the correct isotope symbol and we'll discuss in about two minutes. And don't be shy to submit your responses via Canvas or via the chat feature. seeing a fair number of responses via Canvas. Would anyone like to propose their response in the chat? Just so that way everyone else can see um, part of what other members of the class are thinking. Would someone like to try writing or proposing a symbol for this element in the chat? Yes, I have a lot of people proposing it's uranium. It has a positive charge. And would someone like to provide their proposed mass number? Almost the entire class got this, actually the entire class who's responded so far has gotten this question perfect. 235, yep, wonderful. Ah, okay, so let's, let's talk through this process. So first and foremost, Let's just write down what we know. Our number of protons is 92. So if we look in the periodic table, what element has an atomic number of 92? And remember, I gave you a copy of the periodic table a while ago in the note set. Any page that has it, you, you're more than welcome to, to flip over to that page. And what element has an atomic number of 92? Yep, uranium, yep. So we have our symbol for our, our atomic symbol. Okay, our number of neutrons is 143. So then we can calculate our mass number by taking 92 plus 143, and that gives us 235. Okay, and then our charge is equal to our number of protons minus the number of electrons. And we know our number of electrons is 91. So 92 minus 91 gives us a charge of plus one. Uranium 235, um, quite an infamous isotope as it's the principal component uh, or partial component of most common nuclear weapons. Um, so quite an infamous isotope throughout our history. Does this 
process of calculating the mass number charge and figuring out the atomic symbol make sense to everyone? Any questions on this example? The class is doing quite well on these problems, which is good to see, good to see. So let's do a, a few more guided examples. So other ways of asking these sorts of problems. So in this problem, we're asked to write the isotopic symbol or an isotope of sulfur that contains the same number of neutrons as silicon 28. So this is where we have to do some higher order reasoning here. So silicon 28. Let's go to the periodic table and would someone like to help me out? What is the atomic number of silicon? What is the atomic number of silicon? What is silicon's atomic number? If you look in the periodic table and you look for silicon, what do you see? 14, yep. Perfect, so we can fill in our atomic number of 14. And in this problem, in this problem, we're asked to write the isotope symbol for an isotope of sulfur that contains the same number of neutrons as silicon 28. So it falls to reason then, we should probably figure out how many neutrons silicon 28 has. So if we take 28 minus 14, we get 14 neutrons. So then, for sulfur, for sulfur, let's think about what we know about sulfur. Do we know the number of protons sulfur has? Do we know the number of protons that sulfur has? Yes, and how many protons does sulfur have? 16, yep, if you look in the periodic table, you'll see a 16, so we have 16 protons for sulfur. And in this case, if it has the same number of neutrons as silicon 28, how many neutrons do we have? If we have the same number of neutrons as silicon 28, how many neutrons do we have? 14, yep. So then our mass number would then be 16 plus 14, which is 30 which would give us the following symbol. You don't need to technically include the 16. I'm just putting it for completeness sake. Does this example make sense? Any questions on this example? If not, I'd like you to open up the problem solving session 2.11-3. And let's take about three minutes to work through the following two examples. Ah, yes, we are assuming, we are, we're assuming that both of these elements are neutral unless otherwise stated. You're welcome to assume the elements are neutral unless you have additional information on the number of electrons or additional information given in the problem about the charge of each atom. In this case, the, no, the number of electrons isn't explicitly stated, um, so you're welcome to assume that they're neutral as we don't have any information beyond that. Does that make sense? Perfect, perfect. So let's take about three to, three to four minutes to work through the following two examples, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. And don't be shy to submit your responses via the chat or via the Canvas quiz functions. 
Let me see some reasonable reasonable responses in the chat and via the the Canvas quiz feature. Let's try to get a few more responses, and we'll discuss in about a minute and a half to two minutes. And don't be shy to message your responses via the chat feature or submit your proposed responses using the Canvas quiz feature. I'd like to get a few more responses before we discuss, otherwise we'll discuss in about a minute. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So first and foremost, we need to calculate the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons for a nitrogen 14 atom that has a minus three charge. So our mass number is 14, our charge is three minus, and from the periodic table, what is the atomic number for nitrogen? What is the atomic number for nitrogen? If we look at the periodic table, Seven, yep, exactly right. So then we can solve now for the num, we know that our number of protons, that's easy, that's just equal to the atomic number. Our number of neutrons is equal to the mass number minus the atomic number, which gives us seven neutrons. And then our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons minus the charge, which gives us 10 electrons. Perfect. Now let's talk about this next example as it sometimes uh, catches people off guard. So for what is the isotopic symbol for an isotope of copper that has three more neutrons than copper 63? So we have copper 63, okay, and if we add neutrons, so if the mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, if we add three neutrons, we essentially add three to our number of neutrons, then our mass number, all we have to do is just add three. So our mass number for this new isotope would be equal to 66. So then this would just be copper 66. Remember the number of neutrons only affects the mass number. The number of neutrons does not affect the atomic number or the charge. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so everything's the same except for the mass? Yes, 
because okay. the number of neutrons only affects the mass number. Any other questions on this example? Wait, what about the charge though? What's a charge? Ah, so copper 63 is neutral. It has a charge of zero. So okay. copper 66 would also be neutral. Mm -hmm. In general, you are, you're allowed to assume that your atoms are neutral unless you're given additional information. So let's keep going now and let's talk next about isotopes and isotopic abundance. So isotopes, as we established, are the same element with a different mass number and number of neutrons. Okay, so here we have a mass spectrometer. Here we have a mass spectrometer. And quite simply, what a mass spectrometer does is it measures, and it measures something really simple. A mass spectrometer quite simply just measures the mass to charge ratio. The mass to charge ratio of atoms and molecules. So it measures the M over Z ratio, the quote unquote M over Z or mass to charge ratio. Now, why is that relevant to isotopes? Well, let's suppose we look at the two isotopes of chlorine. These two isotopes will have a different mass. So when we inject a sample of chlorine into a mass spectrometer, the mass spectrometer will ionize our chlorine and then measure the mass to charge of each of our component chlorine atoms. So, in this case, we see that there are two major masses. The first mass corresponds to chlorine 35. The second mass corresponds to chlorine 37. Does everyone see the, the mass to charge of 35 and 37 respectively? Does everyone notice this pair of peaks? with chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Now, intuitively, looking at the relative intensity, looking at the relative intensity, do we have the same amount of each isotope? Do we have the same amount of each isotope? Is there the same amount of chlorine 35 compared to chlorine 37, if we just look at the intensity? No, they're, they're clearly different, right? So let's talk about how do we assess that? Well, we know that a percentage of all atoms of that element in nature are of a specific isotope. Isotopes are present in different relative percent abundances in nature. So by looking at the relative intensity, we can say that the relative intensity is pretty close to the abundance. So we're, we're just going to use the relative intensity to estimate the abundance or the percent abundance of each of our isotopes. So we clearly see that chlorine has two major isotopes with chlorine 35 being the most abundant right? It's the biggest peak. Now, further, we can calculate percent abundance um, pseudo quantitatively by measuring the intensity of isotope one and dividing by the intensity of our other two isotopes. This gives us the percent abundance for our isotope. So let's do an example. Let's do an example. 
we see the percent abundance of chlorine 35 is roughly 35, is roughly 75%. So where do we get that number? Well, we see that chlorine 37 is approximately 25%, and chlorine 35 is roughly 75% relative intensity. So if we plug that into our equation, the percent abundance for chlorine 35 is equal to 75% over 25% plus 75% times 100%, which gives us a 25, oops, sorry, sorry which gives us a 75% relative abundance. Does that make sense to everyone? And we can see that visually, right? Does everyone notice how we have roughly three times the amount of chlorine 35? Does everyone notice how the peak is about three times as large? So what this is saying is in nature, 75% of all of our chlorine atoms will be chlorine 35. And likewise, the percent abundance of chlorine 37 is about 25% using a similar equation. So now that we understand how to read these mass spectrometry outputs and how to use the relative intensity to estimate percent abundance, let's try to apply this idea to another example. So I'd like you to open up Canvas Quiz 2.12, and we'll spend about two to three minutes working on the following example. So to answer the two questions that I see in the chat, no, the intensities don't have to add to 100. Your percent abundances will, however. Um, and the 75%, so the 75% in this earlier example, Oops, one moment. That 75% essentially says that in nature, 75% of all of our chlorine atoms will be chlorine 35. Well, the remaining 25% of chlorine atoms in nature will be chlorine 37. Did that answer your question? So this percentage is telling you how many atoms of that specific isotope are present in nature relative to the total number of atoms in nature. So it's saying what percentage of all of our atoms are chlorine 35? And 75% of all of our chlorine atoms are chlorine 35. How do we know what the major isotopes? So the major isotopes are all of the isotopes that you'd observe um, in the mass spectrometry output. The reason why I have to say major isotopes is because some elements have many, many, many isotopes that aren't stable. So I don't want you to list all the little minor percentages. I only want you to list the major isotopes that we're actually observing in our mass spectrometry output. Does that make sense? So let's take about two to three minutes and let's try to estimate and identify the major isotopes of boron given the mass to charge versus relative abundance. And then from this data, I'd like you to calculate or estimate the percent abundance of each isotope of boron. So let's take about two to three minutes to work on this and don't be shy to message me your responses in the chat or to propose your responses using the Canvas quiz feature. Is uh, isotope number one the first shown or the, or the tallest one? Uh, the, 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 the one with the lowest mass, so the first one from left to right. Okay. 
Yeah. Thanks. And you can think of the mass to charge as just a measure of the mass number of the isotope. They're not exactly the same, but they're close enough that you can use that approximation in this case. I see some reasonable responses via Canvas. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and then we will discuss. See some reasonable responses in the chat. Let's get a few more and then we'll discuss in about 30 seconds. Perfect, so let's discuss this example. So first and foremost, we have two major isotopes, which are boron 10 right here and boron 11. Now let's look at the relative abundance. So the relative abundance of boron 10 is about 20. The relative abundance of boron 11, about 95. Uh, you may see something similar to this on an exam. Yeah, it's fair game for an exam. This type of graph is pretty standard for isotopic abundance, yeah. So now, once we have each of, this, each of these pieces of data in hand, once we have each of these pieces of data in hand, we can estimate our percent abundance. So the percent abundance would be equal to 20 over 20 plus 95 times 100%. And we can approximate this to about 20%. I'm not asking for an exact number here. I just want the closest, closest unit of 10. So boron 10 is about 20% of all boron isotopes, while boron 11 So if we punch this into our calculator, let's enter that in. So we have 95 over 115, which gives us approximately 80%. So boron 11 is about 80% of all boron isotopes. So as when you check your work, you want to make sure you, that your percent abundance total is equal to 100%. And as we see, 20% plus 80% gives us 100%. So everything checks out and all is right with the world. 
Does this example make sense to everyone? What's the second part? So we're, we're doing the same thing, but for both of them, because I, I thought it was only... Ah, so um, we're, we're, we calculate it separately, but this second part is a way to check your work. If you did everything correctly, when you add all of your percent abundances together, you will get a hundred. Oh, it should equal. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's just a way, if you're unsure about your answer on an exam, for you to quickly just check and make sure everything is working properly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions on this example? Uh, so for, for exams in Canvas, um, I'll make sure that the number tolerances are pretty broad or I'd set it up as a multiple choice question. Um, the, the reason why I set it up where you'd enter a number into the blank in this case is just so that way um, all of the answers for this part could be bundled together. Um, but if your number is a little bit different, that's understandable. This is estimation. Um, it's not going to be as precise as other methods of calculating percent abundance. Does that make sense? Yeah. How are we writing it on the quiz? So is it boron of 20 has a percent abundance of 20? Ah, it would be boron 10. Oh, oh right, boron 10 and then boron of 12, and they both end up being? Ah, bor it's uh, boron 10 and boron 11. So it would be boron 10 has a percent abundance of 20, and boron 11 has a percent abundance of 80. Okay, I see. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Perfect. So as we went a little bit over, we'll resume in about, we'll resume in about 45 minutes. So I'll see everyone at 1250 for laboratory. Um, I'm planning on lecturing a little bit more in laboratory um, and then uh, for those who don't have the lab box, what we'll do is we'll, we'll I'll set up the camera for recording and we'll run through uh, the wet portion of today's lab. Does that make sense to everyone what's going on? Quick question about the pre-lab questions. Uh, yes. We turn that in once we turn in the whole lab, right? Like yes, yes, yes. Those are turned in once you have the whole lab report complete. Okay, cool. And we turn in the lab reports individually, right? Like we don't have to turn in all three at once? Yeah, you, you can turn them in individually in the designated assignment submission tab. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. So I'll see everyone at 1250 for laboratory. Enjoy your 45 minute break and I'll see you all for lab. <laughs>